have ahead. We have, uh, if you're an indoor beach volleyball, or indoor beach volleyball fan, if you're an indoor volleyball fan, rather, we have the men's Final Four held at Long Beach State. If you are a college beach volleyball fan, they're having that in Gulf Shores, Alabama this weekend. If you are not going to make the trip, you can watch on ESPN, which will be televising it. If you are an AVP fan, which if you're listening to this podcast, let's be honest, you probably are. Uh, we have the, the season opener in Huntington Beach, one of my favorite beaches. It's the beach I first moved to. It's the beach I moved to when I moved here, so it's been kind of my, my home beach of sorts. And we also have an FIVB in Malaysia this week. So awesome week ahead. And what Try and I wanted to do this week was to give a little light to the college beach game. So we had Florida State coach Brooke Niles on the podcast. Many of you will probably know her name. She Not only is she the Florida State head coach. Uh, She's also the wife of Nick Lucena, and she was a former uh, pretty badass player herself. So Brooks is a super fun guest. Her Seminoles are ranked number three heading into this weekend's uh, College Beach Volleyball NCAA Championship. So tune in to ESPN and watch them and hope you enjoy our podcast with Brooke Niles. Is it, did you guys have like like a watch party or anything? Well, we did, but it's the first time we've had, like, a public one, so that was a little nerve-wracking, too, because usually the team will just come over to my house and watch it. Yeah. Um, but we had some, like, boosters and people come, so I was, like, a little unsure of how that was going to go. Yeah. So did everything go okay? Yeah, it was great. It was um, – I was really excited because I had no idea who – I mean, I had a feeling on, like, four teams, but I had no idea who the other teams would be, so it was kind of cool to to be surprised. Yeah, it. Uh, I was. I talked to Todd Rogers today, and he said that his girls were, were freaking out until everything came out, and then I don't know if you got a chance to see the Stetson video, but their girls lost it. They went nuts. Yeah, I did see that video. Um, that was pretty cool. Yeah, and I'm, I think Todd's on the committee, so he must have known before his team – yeah, he I'm knew, sure. and then I know that um, Pepperdine knew. Um, well, not the team did, but uh, Delaney. They like told I think maybe Delaney that you know like they should get flights, <laughs> so oh. and they had to send in okay. their lineup, so they knew that they were in. Um, but Todd was so he had to like jump off the call for like an hour when they were making the selection, and then he came back on and uh, they said, "All right, you guys are in." So he had he had to keep his lips sealed during the show. <laughs> Yeah, no, and it's so crazy because they don't announce it till Sunday, and then you have to, like, do your travel so fast, and luckily we can take a bus, so it's pretty easy for us, but I can't imagine the logistics of flights and all that stuff, especially from Cal Poly. So. Yeah, Gulf Shores, it's, like, it's such a beautiful spot, and I'm sure it's probably super affordable for the NCAA to have it there, but it's just convenient for no one. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because you got to, well, especially for Poly, because they got to go all the way to San Jose, I think, to fly to like Houston to Pensacola and then bus in from Pensacola to the Gulf Shores, which is like an hour and a half. Yeah. Well, um, that is pretty inconvenient, but I love it there. Like, have you ever been? Yeah. The, actually the very first open tournament I played was at the hangout. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's a really pretty spot. Uh, Yeah. It's really pretty. And once you're there, it's kind of cool, especially what the NCAA does with it. But yeah, I'm really lucky. It's so, so close to where we are. Yeah, you guys, I feel like, does LSU, they probably just bust in too, right? Yeah, I bet they do. Um, I'm not sure. I think Stetson would probably bust. I'm not sure, though, because they're not too far from us. Okay. And then, yeah, other schools. I'm sure if I had to fly there, it would be uh, less, I would be less enthusiastic about it. (laughs) Hey, Brooke. Let's try here. Jumping in on the call. Hey. How are you? Pretty good. How you doing? Good. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm excited for uh, for this weekend. Nice. Yeah, I, I'm. I wish it wasn't the same weekend because I really want to go out there and watch it. Yeah, the Nick and Phil are out here already, right? Or not yet? Yeah, they came. They went from China to LA, so oh, they sure. are okay. staying out there to train. Well, they had a little too much time here then. <laughs> <laughs> for that's sure. A, that's a rare one for those boys. I might have to. I know. I might have to let them know about it since it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> that pool was crazy that they were stuck in yeah those Brazil teams are weird and I think we just were off the first game but I didn't really yeah. see any of it and then to have to play from what I gather the Poland game was pretty high level and sure. you know 
lost 16, 14 in the third. So it's like that every time we play them. Either we win or lose, and it's always in the third, and it's always really close. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about modified pool play is that if you lose your first, you're you're in an elimination game for 25th all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, Just that is. I, and I never thought about that part till we were in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then if you get unlucky and the other top seed loses, now you're playing a top seed for 25th, which is really gnarly. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is gnarly. I don't know how you guys ever go into a tournament confident. No. Because it's like, <laughs> all the teams are insane. It's so true. There's no easy... You don't, like, look at your draw, like, to be like, oh, let's see if we got a really good draw. I feel like when I first came on tour, that's how it was. You're like, oh, hopefully we got a good draw. Some of those junk teams, you know, at the lower... At the end of the, of the draw. Now it's like, there's no chance. Every, every bracket, a pool is going to be stacked. You just yeah. wing it. I know. That's how it goes. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what makes it exciting now. Yeah. But with uh, with you guys at Florida State, I know that last time we talked was at the East Meets West. And like you said then, that you know that's kind of the last time. Although I think you guys saw UCLA once more at the end of March. Um but aside from that, that's like the last time that a West Coast team would have seen you. So how's Florida State been looking since? Obviously, your record has been phenomenal. Yeah, well, I mean, we try to play a tough schedule, even though we can't get out. And I, I think the East Coast has gotten a lot stronger than it was when I first started coaching. But, um, yeah, playing those West Coast teams out there at the beginning, we kind of thought we had all the pieces. We just didn't have the right partnerships. And so we've kind of changed a lot. And then the second time we played UCLA, we had the right partnerships, but they were pretty new. So we've done a lot of work kind of developing those pairs as teams. And um, so I think our goal is just to get better every time we're out on the sand, whether that's practice or, or a tournament. Um, and I think we've been able to do that consistently over the last 10 weeks or so. Yeah. And as a coach, like, is it, how tough is it to kind of tinker with the lineup like that to find, the right mix because there's so many different personalities and skill sets and then with the rules too i mean you can only move girls up or down one quarter at a time i feel like it's just like a, a little chess game you have to play with your own team yeah and with us i think it's a little more challenging because we have some indoor crossover players that are pretty physical and help us out a lot but at the beginning of the year they're just getting on the sand and it takes a lot of time for them to develop that game um so that's kind of where we were at is we had these indoor players that we knew could really help us and be really physical and they've just gotten so much better. And then the better they've gotten, the more ideas we've had about who they should play with to make ourselves the strongest team. And so that's, I think where initially we changed some things around lineup wise. And then, you know, it's hard because um, a team can start off as your ones pair, but then other teams can progress at different rates so, um, and you know, you're supposed to play the lineup, how it plays out in practice. So those things, I mean, we've had teams progress at different rates than other teams and, and new partnerships, which has kind of been exciting as a coach, um, to just see how that works out. But I'm always like, Oh, but she would still be really good with this other person. And then it just gets too late to try it. Right. And, um, so, I mean, you could drive yourself crazy with the amount of matchups you probably have on your team. So. Yeah, and I was talking with Todd earlier in the day, and just with how many injuries they've had, he said that I think it was uh, Vanessa Roscoe and Braden Gruenwald have played on every single court this season. And he's just like, <laughs> we've, we've tried literally everything just with like all the injuries. So uh, I feel like as a coach, it's just it's just part of the, the job that you have to just like navigate those super confusing waters sometimes. Yeah, and that's tough with injuries. Uh, like, yeah. we actually use a lot of, like, technology stuff to help prevent injuries or just train a little bit smarter. But I, because I just don't want to be in that position to have to <laughs> move all these things around due to injuries. So um, that, I can't imagine. That's got to be really rough. Yeah. And uh, now, do you, do you still get out and play any? Or is it just, just coaching <laughs> and, and being a mom? I do. I get... I actually got asked to sit. One of our girls had to take a break today and go see the trainer for a second to get, like, Tiger Balm. And they asked me to set, and I was so excited. I think I sprinted, like, the fastest I've sprinted in 10 years over the course. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I try. It's um, 
it's hard because I don't jump high anymore. And like, if I hit a ball out, I'm so mad, but, um, Mm -hmm. sometimes I'll get out there like this time of year, just because I watch a lot of video on these teams. And so we try to be like scout teams against our players. Um, but I used to get out a lot more when I was um, first started coaching because I was kind of fresh off playing. Um, but it's fun. They're so athletic and talented that, you know, if you're not practicing every day, it's really hard to keep up with them. That's what I was going to say. It's, some, it's usually really nerve-wracking playing against your uh, players when you're a coach because you're like, I haven't gotten these reps. Like, I promise I was better <laughs> than this. <laughs> But I've gotten them in my mind, try. Right, that's okay. always... <laughs> hey, just, as good. just as good. I tell them I took my 10,000 hours like 10, 15 years ago, so right. I'm good. I probably don't need as many reps, and I probably get way too tired. But totally. um, it's fun. They they motivate me and uh, kind of keep me young. So I like to do all – I normally do all their conditioning workouts with them and try to do some of their lifting, but I don't get out there and play as much as I'd like. Yeah. How many – or how is it like uh... – coaching against like other players that that were on tour with you back in the day because it seems like that's kind of a natural transition for for players uh that have retired now they're now getting into coaching like there must be a ton of players that that you used to play against and compete against as a player and now you're coaching against them a lot more on the a lot on the men's side as well i think right or men's coaches yeah no it's interesting to see um because what I, I mean, obviously I didn't play against like Stein Metzger right. or um, <laughs> like Brad Keenan, but it's interesting yes. to see how they coach their teams and what I feel like their their style of play is. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun because I know how competitive they are. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, we all are. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think we have a good mindset that we're trying to, I just think we're all like facilitators and trying to teach these kids what we've learned playing at a professional level. And they're just like sponges. They pick it up so fast. So, um, yeah, it is really fun, uh, to compete against them. And then there's other coaches that I don't know from the beach volleyball world. So trying to figure out their style of coaching and how they train their teams is, is the part I like about it. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes I'm like, damn, I wish, I wish these coaches would teach me something. Cause I mean, you guys have been on the pro tour for so long. You guys have so much uh, experience on that stuff. Well, I used to say, like, Holly Boutique runs this club now, and she does all this commentary and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, when I was playing, I just always wanted to practice there because I was like, I just want her to take me under her wing and teach me everything. Right. And, of course, she was still competing, so she was working on her own thing. And now, it's like you, like, I just wish I could sit in on a practice and kind of see what they're teaching their kids. I think it would be really a fun thing to do. Yeah. Should go. I should go sneak in on uh, <laughs> Stein's practices. <laughs> You're more than welcome to come to Florida State. There we go. I don't know. Nick might, try. Nick might not allow it. <laughs> no, they're always looking for people to train. I'm telling you, it's That's affordable. True, yeah. The weather's nice. Totally. Our courts are perfect. Well, we did get out there for uh, to Fort Lauderdale to go train with Phil and Nick and Jason for a little bit. Oh, that's right. That was nice. Yeah. That's when it was cold in California, right? Yeah, exactly. That was a that was a great trip, actually. Yeah. And is Jason your um, first assistant? No. So he's actually, he... um, while he's coaching the guys, he's our director of player development. Oh, player development. Okay. Yeah. So and... he he's just so good at volleyball, and um, <laughs> I knew he was, <laughs> and he's so smart, and. Yeah. Um, I knew he was going to move to Florida to help train the guys, and I just wanted him to somehow be a part of our program. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's also, I think he has, like, ten jobs. He's the hardest worker I've ever met. Yeah. Uh, So just with him coaching them and working with our team, and he coaches a club team, and um, he's in school. He's back in school. So for him being, uh, he kind of helps coach the coaches and helps us do practice planning and and he does helps the team organize some community service stuff. Um, but it's kind of me a way to keep him in Tallahassee until he's done with the Olympic run, and then hopefully he can come be my full time assistant. Yeah, that's. I mean, he he must have racked up more miles in like <laughs> a two year period than anyone. I mean, in, throughout his whole career. But I think the last few years he was going like. Hundred fifty thousand miles he was flying or something because he was in coaching. He was coaching Vanuatu. Whoa! As well as Canada back in like twenty sixteen, 
and he was going yeah. to the South Pacific in between, <laughs> like, the world tour. Yeah, that cool. guy that guy grinds, and he loves volleyball, and obviously, wasn't he, I want to say he was one of the best, def- did he get the best defender award on the FIVB tour at one point? You know what? I'm going to look that up. I'm not sure, but I know, I mean, he played last year in a tournament with Phil after not training for right, yeah. so long, and they got a fifth. <laughs> right. So... And that that was nuts watching them, cause, and it was like he hadn't even stopped playing. Like, he's he's so good. I just yeah. I pulled up Jason's BVB, and it doesn't list any accolades, but I don't know. Well, but I know he was well respected, award. obviously for <laughs> for Phil and and Nick to be on the world tour, and and they were you know top players for so long, and then for Jason to retire and them to pick him up right away says a lot. Yeah, no, it really does. Um, they have a really good relationship, and it's fun to see them kind of, it's like a meeting of the minds every time they're together and see them <laughs> bounce around ideas, and I just like to listen, to be honest. How's his, uh, his video game, his video gaming there? Because I know that Phil and Nick are big <laughs> into uh, some gaming oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> during the downtime. Does Jason survive out there? Yeah, well, actually, it's funny. Our team... At our end of the year banquet, we have these like superlatives that are kind of fun little awards they give um, members on the team, and they uh, gave Jason an award. And it was like most life likely to be caught playing Fortnite instead of <laughs> studying or something like that. Over and, a bunch uh, of college kids. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> and he's like, I, I did that one time, and they were <laughs> just giving him a hard time. But I think in between, everybody's got to have a little downtime, and it's nice to have a video game or two, I think, to take your mind off stuff because he does work really hard. Yeah, especially when you're an athlete, too. It's non-physical, but you still get to compete. And by the way, those three guys are, like, the most competitive people I've ever met in my life, especially uh, yeah. Nick. It's slightly <laughs> annoying trying. I get you. Yeah. <laughs> For you though, I'm sure you are with your friends from way back, too. Though. I I used to be. I thought I was, like, the most competitive person I knew until I hung out with those guys. I'm like, holy crap, it does <laughs> not turn off. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, and they're such good friends that they can kind of give each other a hard time, and right. they know they'll still be friends, so it's kind of funny. Totally. That's how me and, uh, me and Trevor are, for sure. A lot of people probably think we hate each other if they listen to our dialogue. <laughs> I feel like that's the mark of true friendship, like when you can make fun of someone to a pretty far degree and it'd be totally fine. And then you're like, <laughs> you know, you're probably good friends with them. Right. How was your transition as a player to a coach there? Because I know like a lot of players can sometimes struggle with that, just switching roles. How did you kind of ease into that role where you're, I mean, obviously you're totally comfortable with it now and, and leading Florida State to a number three position in the country heading into nationals? Um, I mean, for me, I've always kind of coached, like, just even in college, I coached club indoor, and then, um, as soon as I graduated, I was an assistant coach for my college coach while I was trying to play AVP, so it's, I feel like I've had a lot of time to develop my coaching personality and style, and I worked with a lot of really great coaches, um, but I think I just tried to figure out what how what I would want to be the best player and then tried to just make each individual really good the hard part is making decisions about who plays and who doesn't play but um yeah I don't know I don't know if I really thought about it too much I just tried to just figure out what I would want if I were in their situation um and then obviously I think I've had a really um lots of luck with finding really great assistant coaches um Hector Gutierrez, who's now the head coach at TCU, was my first assistant coach, and he is so fun and has a lot of great knowledge and high-level coaching on the world tour, so I think together it was a really great experience, and, and he really helped me develop the program into what it is today as well. Don't hit that skip button, everybody. We're going to be right back here with Sandcast. Just taking a brief second to give a big thanks to our sponsors. First and foremost, goes out to Wilson. Everyone should be stoked that the AVP season is coming up, which means that you need to order up your Wilson volleyballs or any other volleyball equipment you may need. So go to wilsonvolleyball.com to get that. Best news, you can get a discount. Wilson.
Wilson Sand. It's 20% off if you use our Sandcast Wilson discount. So hop on over, get your preseason equipment, get ready for the season coming up at WilsonVolleyball.com and use Wilson Sand for a 20% off discount. This show is also brought to you by our guys at Firefly Recovery. These guys are awesome. Try just went to Doha and was using Firefly Recovery in the hotel room. They've got them in the recovery tents on the FIVB. They're the best things possible because they're super mobile. You can bring them on planes if you're traveling around the world. I'm about to use them when I go to Vienna and Italy for snow volleyball. You can bring them to work if you want. They're, they just stimulate the blood flow in the area that's sore or injured, and it helps it recover way faster and also just feels really good. So if you're sore, if you're or if you just want to stay on top of your recovery, use Firefly Recovery. It's the best thing on the market right now, and it's really cheap, too. So give them a try. Go to fireflyrecovery.com. And now for our Pacific Coast Wealth Management Olympic FIVB ranking update. Leading the charge for the men is Russians Vyacheslav Krasilnikov and Oleg Stoyanovsky. At number two, welcome aboard two-time gold medalist winners of Sydney and Doha, Esteban and Marco Grimalt, who are cousins, not brothers. Leading the way for the Americans at the moment, though that's likely to change here soon, is Triborn and Trevor Crabb. And for the women, at number one is Brazilian's Rebecca Cavalcanti, winner of the P1440 Top Guns event, and Ana Patricia Silva. At number two from the U.S. is Emily Day and Betsy Flint, silver medalists in Sydney. Uh, followed at number five is Brooke Sweat and Carrie Walsh Jennings. And at number six is Kelly Clays and Sarah Sponso. More Americans at 11 and 13 with Brittany Howard and Kelly Reeves and Alex Kleiman and April Ross, respectively. So really solid showing in our Pacific Coast Wealth Management Olympic Rankings update from the American women here. And now we're going to let you get back to the show. Did you have any coaches or, or well I guess any players that you looked up to growing up as a kid and then did anybody like were there any coaches that you had either on your time in the AVP or at Santa Barbara um, that kind of left an impact on you Ooh, yeah I've had a lot um, I think well Missy I just love um, I've known her for a really long time and she's always been super helpful and um, one of those people that's really willing to share knowledge um, and then when I kind of first started getting really serious about AVP and international, I asked Todd Rogers if I could just follow him around for two years That's awesome. and kind of be his shadow. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause he was, it was, I, it was hard for me. I was living in Santa Barbara and, um, you know, some people weren't the nicest to try to train with them. So I was trying to see, okay, who do I want to be like? And I was like, I'll just, I just want to be like Todd. Hmm. Um, and he was really helpful. And I mean, I worked out with him, Nick and Phil, um, and it just was nice to be around him and he was really, really willing to share all his knowledge, which is funny that we're playing him first round in the NCAAs cause I think that's going to be fun. Um, and then Kathy Gregory coached me at Santa Barbara. Um, she's still one of my mentors and I think we talk weekly now. Um, and then I don't know if you guys remember Scott Davenport, but he coached me for a long time on the AVP and, um, I really learned a lot from him about, um, just technique and things like that. It is uh, it is funny that that you end up playing Todd first round. You guys have played them once this season, like really early, right? Yeah, they came to Tallahassee the first weekend of the year, so okay. they were a completely different team too. Yeah, they've gone through a lot of different looks just th throughout the year with how many injuries they've had. I remember the first time that I saw them play. Um, I don't know if you know Emily Sunny. She at the moment she was on their court too, and I was watching and she kept she would swing left-handed and serve right-handed and then occasionally she would just like turn one line right-handed and then cut the next one lefty and I asked Todd I was like is this girl just ambidextrous she's like no she hurt her shoulder and uh she's just learning how to play left-handed and <laughs> her and Macy Gordon have been so good yeah she's just an unbelievable athlete I mean I think she was originally a water polo player and then um went to Cal Poly to play beach volleyball and she's turned into really one of the best players in the country and won that collegiate Paris tournament last year. So I'm really impressed. I was just watching video on her actually before you guys called. Oh, really? She, yeah. Her left hand, it like looks really normal. Um, it does. She it does looks it. just supernatural. <laughs> that's why I was yeah, surprised when you said she hurt her right arm. I was like, well, her lefty is way better than mine. And that's the only arm I've used since I was born. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it looks normal, and I mean, it's obviously something really hard to scout, so. <laughs> yeah. 
And what uh, what's preparation look like for Florida State before an event like an NCAA tournament? I don't know if you try to keep everything the same or if you you know say like, hey, because I know that you know talking to Anna Collier and, and Stein, it was, you saw two very contrasting ideologies where Anna was like, all right, it's championship season, like it's time to step up and peak. And Stein was like, we don't need to do anything special. We just need to do what we, we've done all season. So it seems like everybody kind of has a different message for their teams. Yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot, too, just in the last four years with being in that title game or close to it. Um, I think we're a little more of the Stein mentality. Like, I want to treat every match as, a, as the same way we would treat a national championship match um, and kind of bring the same energy in because I think that's been an issue with us in the past as we make it into this huge moment and then – um, it's almost like a moment that's sometimes too big for some of the players on our team, and it doesn't have to be. It's just another beach playing a different team across the net, and we just really want to focus on ourselves. So that's kind of been the tone we've tried to take this year. But, again, I feel like the teams I've coached really know how to win and know how to perform under pressure. Um, so we are getting better and better each time we're out on the sand. And, and when I look at them in our conference tournament, I mean, there's just a different look on their faces when they're in that um, tournament and they want to win so bad. And it's just like a real quiet confidence. Um, so that's really nice to see. So I, I guess I'm kind of, I see how they both can, can work it with their teams. Um, and I guess the more time you're in that moment, the more prepared you are for it. But. We try not to overwhelm them with this is the national championship. This is like the only weekend that matters, those sort of things. We just try to treat every weekend kind of the same. Yeah, and I know the NCAA does a great job with the setup and everything and, and with all the, the media. Is it is it difficult ever to keep the girls focused with all of those kind of minor distractions that they haven't necessarily had to deal with throughout the season? Um. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in the past, no. Um, but I have like a brand new, I have a lot of young players on our team that haven't really been in that situation. But we've actually added, which is a big thing for me this year, we've added visualization and meditation, um, which when I played, that's probably something I would have never done. And I do think it has helped us a ton with just um, preparing and letting go if you have a bad game and getting ready for the next one. So hopefully that can still help us into next weekend. Do you guys have a, like an actual coach or a specialist coming in and doing that? Or are you guys kind of running them through it? Uh, we do. We have two uh, sports psychology PhD students on our um, team and they'll come. Whoa. So they don't travel with us everywhere, but when they don't travel, they tape the visualization and meditation, and then they'll travel with us to postseason, so they'll actually do it um, actively with the team. That's really cool. That kind of says a lot about, like, how sports are evolving and how, I mean, the next generation of professional athletes, at least, are going to be that next level, you know, because, I mean, only half of ath even professional athletes right now are tapping into that kind of stuff, so makes sense. I think it definitely, uh, definitely works for me. Yeah, I mean, you can't mess with the science, right? Right, yeah. No, sure. <laughs> I love it. And I've, I've like, because I know that, like you said, that, you know, when you were playing, that meditation sounded like, I don't know, almost like a silly thing to do. Was it tough to get any of the girls to buy in, or were they like, is it now that popular at, at that age, too? Because I know that on the you know, AVP and FIVB and like, you can look at the NBA too. And they're all, they kind of all rave about it. Um, was it, uh -huh. did you have to convince any of them to buy in? Yeah. I mean, I still think I kind of do some, some participate just cause they have to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then some really, some take ownership of it and do it more often. But so we wear these, um, bands on our wrist. They're called whoop bands and it kind of measures your, um, your resting heart rate, heart rate variability, it measures your daily strain, um, and it gives you, like, a score, and you're either in the green, yellow, or red, and obviously going into championship season, we want to be in the green, which means we're feeling good, we're rested, we're getting enough sleep, um, but one of the things, if you're not, and you're in the red, um, which can help you, um, you're more prone to injury if you're in the red, and if your sleep's not good, you can, um, you 
everything in sports, every metric in sports can decrease. So like field goal percentage, service percentage, all that sort of thing. So with um, the people that work with us at Whoop, they have um, give you like modalities to do if you're under recovered. And the biggest one is meditation. So um, I think the fact that the girls notice their recovery is a lot better when they do it um, helps them understand the importance of it. So I think if we didn't have that, it would kind of, they would probably just think I'm some crazy person from California <laughs> trying to do some meditation. But um, the science says it works. So we're kind of going with that right now. And, and it's one of the biggest things we've added this year to our training program. That's awesome. Yeah, I've seen those whoop things before, but I never really knew what it did. Now I, um, I might need to steal that contact from you. <laughs> that, <laughs> well, and we have awesome. a person on staff that just does that. So it's oh, like nice. crazy if you think of all the things it could tell you, and I have no idea. But um, she works directly with athletes and kind of – it helps them accountable too. Um, and then like when we travel to the West Coast – They'll tell us when, what time they should go to bed. Should we stay on East Coast time to wow. play at time? So it really helps them kind of prepare. So this person is getting, collecting all the information from all the players' individual watches or wristbands? Yeah, she's a grad student, so she collects all the information. Um, wow. And then she just gives me the information that I want to know, which is, okay, so-and-so has been in the red for five days, then – Usually we'll, we won't pull them out of practice, but we'll make them, they have to do certain recovery things. And then maybe they don't do like live play. They do more drills, um, things like so that, cool. or they do agility instead of conditioning. So that is really cool. I, I feel like everyone on the world tour would be in the red uh, after every, <laughs> after, after every trip, right? especially like these yeah, long probably. China trips. Oh, I know. Crazy. It's like, how do you even adjust for that? Right. Um, Nick wears it, so you should ask him about it. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to do that. I always hear, um, I don't know if you listen to the Michael Gervais podcast. Do you, you listen yeah. to that one, Trey? Because they're, they're sponsored. Yeah, because right? Whoop's an advertiser on that, and, and Gervais like, raves about it. But And I just don't like wearing things on my like on my wrist, especially when I'm playing or sleeping. I feel like I'd be so uncomfortable. But it sounds like it'd probably be worth it just like suck it up and wear it. Yeah, I think after a while you don't notice it as much. But yeah. some of them uh, tape it on, um, and then you know some of the girls actually wear it in, in this, their sports bra, so it doesn't it's not on their wrist. Or they have like bands you can wear on your like bicep. Okay, yeah, try yeah. tries on whoop dot com right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How can I order one? <laughs> this episode is now officially sponsored by Whoop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of uh, Florida State players, so like not a lot of people on the West Coast were able to see you guys. So what players uh, like should our listeners maybe be looking to watch out for when? Because now we can tune in on ESPN uh, to watch the NCAA championships, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, I love every pair on my team, but if I just go down from top to bottom. Um, Madison Fitzpatrick and Elena Chacon are a really dynamic athletic team. They're both 5'9", 5'8", um, but really athletic and, and physical, and they run they're almost like that Polish team. They run some really quick, um, fast offensive things, try to get people out of system, and they serve pretty tough. Um, and they're actually um, one of the winningest number ones pairs we've ever had um, really? since I've been a coach here. Yeah. And they're undersized. I mean, I think everybody goes into the game thinking they're going to beat them. Um, but they do some pretty cool things, and um, they're just really competitive. So I think they're exciting. Um, our twos pair, Sarah Putt and Peyton Rund. Peyton Rund transferred from St. Mary's, and she was on their ones team. Um, she was a part of the team that gave Sarah Hughes and Kelly Clays their one loss in college and kind of broke their 100-game <laughs> like win streak. After, 103 matches or something. Yeah, so um, it's exciting to have her. She came as a grad student transfer. And then um, our threes is actually a player of mine that two years ago was a ones and an All-American. And then a try, you might know my girl Avery Papinga. She's, her family is like Hawaiian royalty with volleyball. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I do know the Papinga family for sure. I don't know if yeah, I so know she, her personally. Well, she's Brian Papinga's daughter, and she's just – 
unbelievably athletic and dynamic. So they're our threes pair. And then my fours pair, I coach them a lot um, in the box. And so they're, I think, a really fun team. But one of the girls, Peyton Caffrey, is an indoor crossover player that just has the heaviest arm you've ever seen, heaviest, <laughs> quickest arm. Uh-huh. And Molly McBain is a Canadian player that um, is just really smooth. Um, she's not like... I mean, everything she does is just, it's like a gazelle walk, running across the court. And then um, my fives pair is a freshman who got freshman of the year. Her name's Kate Privet, um, along with one of my seniors that's been in the starting lineup since she's a freshman. And Kate is so pound for pound against every athlete that we've measured at Florida State. She's like in the top 5%. And that's football, basketball, oh, um, track wow. in terms of her jump and her quickness. So... She's super fun, and then Macy and is just, on your court just a winner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah, no, it is crazy. Um, but I think the top teams just you have to have a lot of depth because every win is important, oh, and sure. you get it at a different spot every time. So you mentioned that like a lot of these players have really unique styles. Like your your ones team, I think you said uh, they're running that quick kind of Polish offense and whatnot and and i mean all your players have different strengths uh how is it or how do you guys go about like develop developing like a style of play like is it per team like each team and individual gets to kind of pick their own style or because i always wonder that uh because it's so different than you know beach where it's just two people and you learn your partner's style and then you play to their style but you guys have like five teams and you're all one big team and How does that work in terms of, is there like a whole team style or is it every team kind of creates their own? Because I know you guys are training together and doing the same drills and how does all that work? Um, Yeah, at Florida State, we actually do a lot of group training. So we do try to take the pairs individually and coach them as if they were our only team Mm -hmm. and try to figure out what works best for them. Um, But there's a lot of things, like when I first came to Florida State, Um, they were just taught some different things that there's some basics that everybody has to know. Um, and then actually my assistant coach, Angela rock has been a really, um, big proponent of running different sets and uh, almost like playing a little dirty going on too, things like that, that I normally are out of my comfort zone. Yeah. So I think like just a combination of different coaches helping each team has really helped them kind of develop some different things. And there's some teams like my force team, they just love running, up and down and now we finally got them to run back sets and and sometimes a shoot set and it's really fun to see them do it but sometimes at the beginning of the year it was like pulling teeth um so it's just i think it's just different each player and i try to make it so we're developing you as an individual not trying to fit somebody in a system um but i don't know what people think of our program and how we train players so yeah i'm sure it's very different uh throughout the country because I mean some schools you guys are obviously very deep but I'm sure some schools just have one team that's good or even one player that's really elite and and that's going to be a lot different because you're going to have to treat those that one athlete who can play at an extremely high level in all the skill sets maybe differently than the other ones so I'm sure it's Uh different throughout um, any program yeah like we played College of Charleston and they had a team that played two down and they were unbelievable. And it was really difficult for us <laughs> to play against them. Um, and then we'll play like UCLA. I feel like he does a really great job with his pairs kind of, they each have their own system of play too. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. I find that the coaches that have played more kind of um, train a team to the team's strengths. So, and I don't know if that's just an experience thing of playing against different types of offenses and stuff, but it's definitely interesting. Yeah, I know that that's been Stein's big thing at UCLA because they're not all that big, whereas USC, like, it's like six foot and above. Like, that's like a, that's like a height requirement. They're so tall. <laughs> but uh, UCLA is fun to watch because, like, the McNamaras are always running shoots and back shoots. And um, Sarah Sponsel and Lily Justine were running, like, back shoot slides, which is pretty fun to watch. But <laughs> it's uh, – yeah. It, it's fun watching the level of play at the college level because, you know, watching like a court one, um, you know, it, like any of the court ones, I think at the NCAA championship, like that could easily be an AVP match. 
Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy how, I mean, some of these girls coming up that I'm recruiting have, I played volleyball, I grew up on the beach, and they're going to play more volleyball than I've ever played, and they're so athletic and physical. I mean, like, the potential of some people is just unlimited, and, you know, a lot of players that, you know, I'd say in the top five teams also compete on the world tour or AVP and finish pretty well, so um, it's pretty cool to see them play in college in more of a team sport atmosphere and see what they can do at that level. And then, I mean, I think some of these players on, um, I know Sarah Sponsel is probably going to go right into Olympic qualifying as soon as Gulf Shores is done. So it's cool to, um, to see them. Yeah. I think, uh, her and, and Tina and the McNamara's are all headed straight to Brazil, basically. Right oh, after, wow. Cause I think That's there's crazy. a four star in, uh, it's um, Instead of, I think that'll be maybe two weeks after Golf Shores. That instead, of, during, I think that conflicts with AVP Austin. Oh, wow. I've never, yeah, that's, that's really exciting. I haven't really ever thought of it. Like the fact that in our sport, the college players can be somewhat immersed in the pro tour while still in college. Whereas, like, you know, other big sports, I don't know how like tennis is and whatnot. Obviously, you can't uh, collect money, but. I mean, you can really get a lot of experience at the pro level before you even graduate from college. And that's so rare uh, compared to other sports. I feel like golf is like one of the few. I remember watching golf, you can uh, do that. Uh, this kid named Bo Hosler was in high school when he made the U.S. Open. The one that was uh, in San Francisco mm. at Olympic. Um, I feel like that's one of the few exceptions for sports. Cause it's not like LeBron could play in college and the NBA at the same time. Right. Well, it's, it's certainly going to make the going to make it difficult to be a professional uh, female volleyball player. I think the guys are going to slowly catch up, but the girls are just like, they're getting more and more stacked every year. If you're if you're one of those top veteran women playing, you're like, oh my god, they're just like, they're just, <laughs> they're just pumping out great players. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, and I think it's funny because when you go to college to play beach, you have all this lifting and coaching and everything set up for you. Which, as you know, when you leave college and you try to play on the Pro Tour, you have to set that all up and pay for it yourself. Totally. So it's like, it's like almost like a little training ground um, for professionals. So it's really exciting. It's, but actually, try. Yeah. We're starting. We have a men's beach club team at Florida State. Oh wow. And a lot of those guys are our managers for our team, so they come and help us with practice, help us initiate drills and stuff like that. And so we're trying to start men's beach volleyball, and I and I know they play in some tournaments too, th- throughout the fall. Um, but I think the more the women's game grows, I think the men's game will slowly come along with it. I hope. Totally. No, I, I definitely agree. Uh, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a slow process, and who knows, you know, how many years it would take to get men's as a real sport. But yeah, no, totally. I, I completely agree. If the women's keeps going at this rate, the men's going to go right with it. Definitely grateful. Are, uh, are John Justice and, and Adam Wankowski in that crew? John is. So John's actually my volunteer coach this okay. year. Uh, I, I saw him out at East Meets West. I love it. <laughs> He's so good, too. His ball controls. I had, I had to play him in Austin, and uh, I watched him play with Adam at the USAV um, Collegiate Championships last year. And he digs a hard driven as good as anybody <laughs> I've seen. He's yeah. good. No, he's really good, and he's really a good coach for him being so young. And then now he trains with Nick and Phil and Jason. Um, and then his only other reps are, like, serving and hitting at our practices. So uh, he, I think he's in the college, collegiate pairs tournament after Gulf Shores as well. Um, but I don't think he's playing with Adam. He's playing with a new guy named Bryce. Okay. So it should be interesting to see how they do. Got it. And are you, any of your girls, are they planning on playing AVP qualifiers after uh, after season's over, or, or is you just focusing on golf shores for now? Yeah, no, I think they have, I think quite a few are signed up for the Austin one. Um, and then actually a lot of our incoming recruits play AVP qualifiers all summer, so that's kind of cool. Um, but I think most of them, yeah, their plan is to go straight into the AVP, which is awesome. That's awesome that you have incoming recruits playing professional qualifiers. Yeah. 
No, I know. And they're like uh, the Dig the Beach series in Florida. We have some incoming recruits that are in the finals every weekend <laughs> against some AVP teams. So it's really the game's growing so much. It's really exciting to see where it's going to be in the next couple of years. Is that a little nerve wracking uh, knowing because I know how NCAA compliance is uh, going to USC. Of course, they're like the poster child of, of <laughs> having to deal with that stuff. Um it must be a little stressful knowing that like all these uh, kids are uh, even before they come to college have kind of like been around the opportunity to get paid and it, it really is like up to them to be smart about it and, and not have collected money and all that. Is that, is that something that kind of uh, you guys have to be really cautious about? Yeah. I mean, everything's kind of, you have to self report to the clearing house when you're a junior, but um, I mean, I, everybody is so afraid of it threatening their eligibility that I think a lot of juniors don't take any money at all. Um, With the college kids, though, they just changed the rule. I believe it was January this year where you can collect enough prize money over the calendar year, um, which before it was like a week before an event. If you had hotel or training, that's the only thing you can collect money to equal those expenses. So now, like, it just adds up for the whole year, which I think – will give people more opportunity um, to play and get money that they deserve to pay for expenses. Because how many times do you yeah. play an AVP? And, I mean, even if you win every tournament, I don't know if that would make so much money that it would um, be so much more than your training of coaching and traveling to tournaments and food and all that stuff. Right. Sometimes some of the up-and-coming pros are not even uh, breaking even. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's getting better, um, right. which is exciting. But yeah. yeah, if you think about somebody just starting out and barely making out the qualifier or not qualifying, I mean, it's not going to break the bank there. Totally. And <laughs> that wouldn't be really all that fair to make someone not only pay for all this stuff, but not allow them to be reimbursed at least. Yeah, and I think it was just a nightmare with compliance because. I know our players have to turn in a form and then after each tournament turn in all the receipts and then they have to go through this thing before they can be eligible. And um, I just think it's easier now for everybody to be accountable. I, uh, when I was uh, 2016, I want to say, um, I was out in Austria and uh, Summer Hughes and, um, oh, sorry, Sarah Hughes. <laughs> Summer's <laughs> playing with Sarah. But, um, Sarah Hughes and uh, Kelly Clays were out there like playing one of their first big events uh and i was telling him all right you guys need to buy first class all the way home for yes. sure like you need to fully figure out whatever that number is of your prize money and just like max it out <laughs> I didn't think about might that. as well <laughs> yeah did they do it i think they did that would be amazing actually because flying first class on an international flight is one of the best things you could ever do yeah exactly and then here i am like Six five sitting in the back, and these college girls are up front. Like, <laughs> We're flying for free. <laughs> oh my god, that's awesome! Yeah. yeah, I think there is a lot of things like that where if you just place higher than you thought you would and get more money, you just spend it on a nice hotel room, and it's right. like that's probably not the right thing to do. Um, and then I know that, uh, you have a busy week ahead, so we won't keep you too much longer. Um, what's your, the schedule looking like for you guys when you're heading over to Alabama? The team is going to go Wednesday. We're going to practice in Tallahassee and then we actually have finals this week. So oh, week. <laughs> yeah, it's, it usually was my first year. It was the week before Gulf Shores. So they were done with finals and then we had like a week to train and, ease our way up to the championship and now it's the week of so some of them are going to be taking finals thursday morning too and then i'll head up wednesday night um just uh because i have somebody that can't watch my kids till wednesday night and then we practice and do like some autograph sessions and interviews thursday and then play starts friday win or go home awesome and you're uh you lead off with polly do you know what time your match is or is the, the schedule still tbd yeah, we're at noon. The whole thing starts at 9, so I think USD plays at 9. We're the third match, and we start at noon, central time. Okay. Um, and then I think everything – there's, like, a game every hour. I'm not sure how it works with losers and winners bracket yet, but we're just taking it one game at a time. How many courts do they, they have five courts running simultaneously? Yeah, so this one's five at the same time 
for at least the first two days. And then after that, they go, they're going to do something a little bit different this year. They're going to go two and then three. Um, okay. And I think, I think just for more TV time. But right. once you win the duel, you just played a decision. So they blow a horn and everybody stops playing once a team's gotten their three wins. Okay. That's how um, they do it at USC with the, and it's, it definitely adds to the drama. It was the Pac-12 network couldn't have asked for a better situation for the Pac-12 championships where everything came down to set number three on, on court two with uh, Therese and Sammy Slater and, and Sarah and Lily, uh, because they have that two court and then three court system. So it, it, mm-hmm. it always adds to the drama. It makes for some good TV. Yeah, no, that was a really competitive tournament. We were, we had an off weekend, so we were all sitting there watching all of it. Um, it was fun. For sure. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we have one question. We ask every guest on the show. Um, if you had to give an up-and-coming beach volleyball player a piece of advice, which I'm sure you do quite <laughs> often <laughs> as a coach, so uh, what would that piece of advice be? Oh, wow. Um, I would just say, say yes to all the opportunities you get. Um, I think some of, at least me now being on the East Coast, some of the players I train are just uncomfortable with moving out West or, you know, even playing in tournaments around the country on AVP um, or whatever level they want to play in. So um, I just think just trying to take every opportunity you have to play volleyball and get better and maybe hold off the career part for a little bit if you want to play and be a professional athlete because you can always work the rest of your life. Um, I don't know. I, no, I, I guess that I would be my that answer. Advice. Let's delay work as long as we can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it worked for me. I'm 38, and I feel, still feel like I don't have a real job. That's it's awesome. So fun. I think that's how you know you're you're pretty successful in life is when your work doesn't feel like work at all. Hopefully, yes. My <laughs> raising my children feels like work, so uh, that's the hardest part. <laughs> how are the boys doing, by the way, Cole and Gunner? They're good. Gunner is like gonna be taller than me next year, and then Cole is like a bruiser. Like he wrestles kids at his school. Oh my god! And yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I mean, he's really sweet. He's not like a mean kid or anything, but <laughs> um, he's definitely having an older brother. And I, I had an older brother too, and I think he's just learning how to be like a little more physical of a kid than Gunner was. So it's definitely interesting to see their personalities. Now, are Gunner and uh, Sebastian, Phil, Phil's kid, are, are they going to be a beach volley duo in the next uh, decade or two? I think, yeah, I think that's what Jen and I hope. And then, um, like, they're still the best of friends. And Sophia, too. So the three of them together is, like, the cutest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and Sophia and Gunner, like, hold hands, and it makes us wow. a little uncomfortable. It makes us <laughs> uncomfortable, for sure. I would love to see the guys' faces when, uh, when that happens. <laughs> Especially oh yeah, Phil's. like Gunner will tease Gunner teases Phil, and he'll be like, "Uncle Phil, I'm gonna kiss Sophia." And he's like, <laughs> not. So it's and they're Gunner just turned six, and Sophia is four, I think, four or five. So wow, that's, that's really cute. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, good luck and safe travels to all of Florida guys. State this week, and good luck to Nick too uh, in AVP Huntington. Not too much. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck unless they play you, right? Tom? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'd love to see them in the finals. Yes. Yes. Me too. Love Against it. you for sure. Yep. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks. So much.